Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today, I'm speaking with a grandmother of nutrition. She's retired, but still a professor at three universities and blogging every day. She's a machine and a good advert for healthy eating. Let's get a common sense approach to eating with Marion Nessel. listening to you on every podcast I could find oh, you on. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. So I almost know what you're going to say before you, do. you say Well, it. I'm also quite predictable. So. <laughs> no, you were very good. I had you on the, the Bill Nye Science Guy podcast. Oh, that's an old one. That's an old one, yeah. That was, that was one of my favorite. You were very, uh, you're getting all these people calling in and you're answering all these rapid fire questions <laughs> and you could just tell, you could just tell that you've been doing this for been years. Been doing this for know. a while, right. Oh. There's no question that I could ask you related to nutrition or food politics that you could not answer probably. Probably, yeah, I'd be surprised. Well, I, don't, I don't try, I don't, so. don't try. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your last book was really good because you took all these these commonly asked questions and you answered them in a really because for an ac- academic you you write really well don't you in a conversational <laughs> you break down all this this complex terminology well i like so that was a lovely book i like being thank you i like being able to communicate and my goal in writing is to write clearly um, I'm not trying to be a stylist or a poet. Um, I'm just trying to be really clear so that people can understand what I'm saying. Because so much of nutrition information and advice is obfuscated in some way. Um, it's discussed in passive voice. You never know who's responsible for anything. And because I found all of that very difficult to understand, and I'm basically self-taught in nutrition, um, it's very important to me that people understand what I'm saying, whether they agree with it or not. And I have no expectation that people will necessarily agree with my opinions about food or nutrition. But I do want them to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> well, you do a great job. Thank but you. Do you think Do you think people want us to be confused because there's all these different diets and all these different lobbyists? Do you think they want us to be confused? Well, if you're confused about uh, what you're eating, then you think, well, it really doesn't matter what I eat. I can eat anything. Um, and I think from the standpoint of companies that are selling junk foods, what we now call the ultra-processed foods, um, it's very important for them, for people to be confused. What we learned from the cigarette industry was that the first thing that you'd want to do if you are selling a potentially harmful product is to confuse the science. You want people to have doubt about whether the science exists and how strongly it associates that product to harm to health or harm to the environment. So that's a classic technique and it's one that has been adopted with great success by food companies. Um, so the first thing that the sugar industry wants to do is to demonstrate that, you know, if you think there's something you should, there's something wrong with eating a lot of sugar. Well, the science isn't so strong on that. You can really have it. It really doesn't matter. Exercise is more important than what you eat and obesity. I mean, that kind of thing. They're really good the at late- that. They are. The, the latest book that got me confused, well, I'm in the south of Italy here, near where Ancel Keys uh, is, ah, yes. at I met Ancel Keys. Really? <laughs> yeah, he was about 100 years old at the time. <laughs> well, it worked for him. He moved to a blue zone and it worked. Yeah, a little dottery, but he was still giving speeches and writing papers. So wasn't there a big, so perhaps you can clear this up for me, because there's this big debate between fat and sugar and which mm. one makes you fat and there's these there's these books written by um what was the name gary Taubes. <laughs> oh yeah and uh, and nina nina Teichholz. Teichholz. right right um i'm a calorie person 
I think that when okay. it, I think the evidence shows that when it comes to body weight, the calories are what counts. If you eat more calories than you're expending in physical activity, you're going to gain weight. And it really doesn't matter where the calories come from. It may be that calories from sugar and carbohydrates encourage people to eat more. And so you're taking in more calories. But I don't think that the evidence that tries to distinguish one kind of calorie from another is very strong when it comes to body weight. Um, and if you want to lose weight, the easiest way to lose it is eat less. It works every yeah. time. Um, but what you eat matters a lot to health. And if you and we know what a healthy diet is, it's so simple that the journalist Michael Pollan can do it in seven words: eat, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, that's all there is to it. Okay, so what would be the best diet for a diabetic? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. <laughs> so, yeah. because in the south of Italy here, there's still an epidemic of diabetes because some of those plants are. A pasta, yeah. Well, yes, um, but it's calories, and the single greatest risk factor for type two diabetes is um, being overweight. Uh, the uh -huh. best way to deal with type two diabetes is to lose weight, and you don't even have to lose that much. Just reversing cal calorie balance is enough to me to reduce the symptoms for most people. For most mm -hmm. people, um, not everybody who is overweight gets type two diabetes, but if you look at the population of people who have type 2 diabetes, um, 85 to 95 percent of them are overweight. Mm -hmm. So there's a very, very strong correlation. And I've known people who got rid of their diabetes symptoms just by losing five pounds. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that really took care of it. They increased their physical activity. They stopped eating so much. They cut out sweets because sweets make you want to eat more sweets. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they took care of it. Uh, but I think it's a body weight issue. And it's why mm -hmm. the enormous rise in obesity in so many populations is such a serious problem. It's not obesity that makes you sick. It's the risk it's a risk factor for other kinds of conditions um, that are best avoided and type 2 diabetes is first in line mm. just calories yeah no so I'm you know I think the evidence shows that if you eat too much you gain weight if you gain weight you're at higher risk right. for type 2 diabetes heart disease cancer mortality all kinds of problems mm. some of the people of diabetes are not overweight though that's Maybe true. Genetic, though. Well, there's two different yeah. kinds of diabetes. There's type one and type two, um, and the type one is a, essentially an autoimmune disease that has nothing to do with obesity. But the diet that's healthiest for them is the same diet. Right, <laughs> yeah. whole food. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants, but not necessarily, I, I, not necessarily exclusively plants, but mostly. I had Michael Grieger on from Nutrition uh -huh. Facts as well. Mm -hmm. He's fun. He's, he, he's a personality, no? Yeah, he's really fun. <laughs> and he says the same thing, yeah, mm -hmm. so mostly plants. I also spoke to Neil Barnard, mm -hmm. and he got me to be a bit more a bit more vegan just because of mm -hmm. the, like you say, the, the, the burden on the planet. Even, you can argue about these different diets, mm -hmm. yeah, but the, the burden on the planet, it's clear that it's better to be... Mostly less, plants. Mostly plants. <laughs> yeah. and, and organically made. Um, that would also help. Uh, yeah, I mean, both of them follow vegan diets. I don't, um, although I follow my own advice, mostly plants. Hmm. Yeah, I studied Ayurveda, uh, studied to be a practitioner, and um, they call they call um, diabetes madumea, which means honey urine because your urine uh, is so because sweet. It's sweet. Because the sugar, because you pee, yeah. you pee out the sugar. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So sure, surely it would be better for them to eat less carbs and more fat. Uh, it depends on how many calories they're eating. You can't mm. separate that out from calories. If they are not overeating calories, I don't think it makes very much difference. If they are eat, overeating calories, it does make a difference. Okay, comes. 
it's lovely speaking about to you because you've seen everything you know you started in 1975 was it yes that's, my first class was in 1976 the fall of 1976 that was a very long time ago <laughs> but you've seen every fad diet come and go no oh yeah and many times that you know they come and go under different names there are only a few things that you can alter in diets you know i mean you can alter actually it's carbohydrates and fats are the big ones because protein is the same no matter what you do um and they come in different versions it's sort of amusing to see them they're very popular people follow them for a while and you know right now it's paleo um which is a version of a high meat diet, a more high fat diet, but the um, they come and they go, and then people go on them. They work for a while, and then they don't. Mm -hmm. I guess with that's in more of the adult stage. But um, what I also loved about your work is that you talk a lot about defective diet on children because they don't have a choice. You know, they put, eat the food put in front of them, mm -hmm. um, and they've really been the victims, and especially now with the. The, the coronavirus crisis. Oh, yeah, it's um, just awful. But it's more than the food put in front of them because the food industry deliberately markets to children to get children to ask for the foods that are advertised. Uh, yeah, course, and yeah. they're very good at that. Yeah. It's a terrible situation, though. You've, you've documented it so well with your books, but um, and you said it started in the 80s with Reagan and the, and the food lobby movement. Well, they, they're always been fat diets and there's always been interest in nutrition um, and various kinds of people fatting away in and out. What changed with the Reagan administration was capitalism um, mm. or neoliberalism if you prefer <laughs> Sounds um, nice, huh? if you you know if you prefer but it was an economic system that valued profit over any other social value um, so that the system became increasingly rigged in favor of corporations um, and deregulation I think started in the United States deregulation started in a serious way in the early 1980s and a lot of things were deregulated that had a big effect on the way people were eating um, one of them was Wall Street, of all things. Uh, in 1981, uh, something called the shareholder value movement got hold of Wall Street. And this was a movement that called for higher immediate returns on investment. Mm -hmm. And that's been tough on all corporations. But it was especially tough on food corporations because they were already producing far more food than Americans needed. We have twice the number of calories in our food supply than people need on average. And some of that is wasted, which contributes to the waste problem. Um, but it's still way more than people need. That makes the food industry extremely competitive. And so they're looking for all kinds of ways to get people to buy more of their products, to increase their market share, to get people to eat more in general. And that's what happened. Food became ubiquitous. I mean, food went into libraries, places where there used to be signs all over the place telling people they couldn't bring food in. And then all of a sudden there were cafes in the library because they made so much money. Mm -hmm. um, and portions got larger. And, you know, I'm always saying if I had one thing that I could, one concept that I could convey it would be that larger portions have more calories hmm, kind of obvious but <laughs> you would think <laughs> you think it's like a collective insanity that or a period that we're going through and it should pass over oh i don't think so i don't think so i mean what we have is a, a first world problem we have a lot of food available people it's very cheap because mm -hmm. of federal policies of one kind or another um and that makes it available. Everybody can afford it. Most people aren't starving. Most people have lots and lots of choices. Um, and there's waste built into the system. So the and food is one of life's greatest pleasures. Uh, you know, we love it. And it's something that you put inside your body. So it's extremely intimate. Mm 
It's personal in a way that almost nothing else is. Um, so people have very strong emotional attachments to the food that they're eating. Um, and that has evolutionary value that keeps you from starving to death. You know, if you didn't want to eat, you'd be in big trouble. But it's only good you know? from here to here, no? as I point to my throat <laughs> and my mouth. <laughs> right. When I fly... I mean, America is probably you. You have the worst example now. I mean, when I, but it's just, when I fly over America, you can see all the corn fields, and then you see, ah, yes. and then you have these. They take it from there and they put it in these feed lots. So there's complete separation. It's this industrialized food complex. It's, well, also, all of that industrialized food complex is not growing food for people. It's growing feed for animals or it's growing fuel for automobiles. 40% of United States corn goes into ethanol production for that cars. Much. Wow. 40%. Try and get your head around that percentage. So if there was ever, if they wanted to grow more food, they could because people oh, always no say, at all. "Oh, we we have to do this industrialized farming because mm. the population is going to be ten billion. People will starve." But you're saying but that they're they, growing. They're not growing food for people. They're growing food for animals. Yeah, animals if we and ate less, if if we ate less meat, which your vegan guests would highly approve of, and even I would approve of eating less meat, um, then we wouldn't need to grow all that. Yeah. We could use that land for growing food for people with no trouble at all. So, so what's the solution then? Is it is it top down or bottom up? Oh, I think it has to be both. Top down won't do anything unless there's bottom up. So there needs to be real political movement to try to get a food system that's healthier for people and for the environment and the planet. Um, and without that leaders won't act um, and they will only act if there is enormous political pressure on them to act and I'm hoping that we'll get some of that mm. I was reading in your book about the work Michelle Obama did to try and improve school dinners yes and that was an example of the food movement not putting enough pressure because all of the pressure on the Obamas was for doing nothing and for favoring corporate food. And the food movement, which supported um, let's, her Let's Move campaign, did not exert enough pressure so that they were able to get anything done and counter the pressure from the food industry. It just didn't work. Because it's too powerful lobbyists. Yeah, they have, well, they have money. You know, they pay uh, fortunes to have lobbyists in Washington making sure that nothing happens that might reduce sales of their products. Is there anyone on the other side, just individuals, or is there any other organization battling back? Well, there are thousands, literally thousands of organizations, um, but they're not unified. They're not much money. Um, I mean, they're, they're doing very good work. They're not unified, and they're not paying lobbyists the way that the food industry can afford to, play, to pay lobbyists. It's just, so what would be, could do those organizations not get together, or... How to well, I, your solution? I would hope so. I would hope so. Yeah. It's what I'm pushing for all the time, and there are other groups that are also pushing for it. Um, but there are reasons why the groups don't get together. The issues seem like they're very different. Some people are working on agriculture issues. Some people are working on anti-hunger issues. They don't really see the connection between them. Some people are working on fair wage issues. Um, all of these groups need to be united around common issues um, and press for the kinds of legislative changes that we need. I think that's the only way it's going to happen. My last guest was Eric Topol, the, the doctor, <laughs> and he's one of the most influential doctors, and he's tried to get doctors to come together because they're all members of their own organizations, Yeah, like the cardiologists mm -hmm. have their association, mm -hmm. and the, the, the dietitians have their association, but there's a million doctors. So if they mm -hmm. could come together, they could really do something, no? And they could. I mean, they and you need to have them coming together if you're going to exert real political power. 
um, you know, there, uh, uh, Michael Pollan again complained during the Obama administration that the food movement looked great on paper and it was doing wonderful things at the grassroots level, but it had no real political power. And without that, you can't get government to do anything. Do you, do you still get surprised by things or does nothing surprise you anymore? Oh, no, I still get surprised yeah. by things. I mean, I was pretty astounded by the um, what the effects of the coronavirus pandemic mm. on revealing what was going on in meatpacking plants because meatpacking plants became epicenters of viral transmission because the workers are on top of each other. But not only that, the meat companies forced them to keep working while they were sick. That amazed me. Even when public health authorities wanted those plants closed down um, and and if the workers were going to keep working, they had to have protective equipment and be distanced. The meat companies instead went to the president and got the president to invoke the Defense Production Act to keep the workers in place. I was kind of amazed by that. I was kind of I was kind of amazed by the revelation that we have two complete food supply chains in the, the United States, and when restaurants closed all the supply chains that were that were set up to supply restaurants couldn't switch to supermarkets so they had to destroy vast amounts of food while people were going hungry because they were unemployed and didn't have any income um, so that's been full of the coronavirus has been full of one surprise after another the department of agriculture's decision uh, to deal with the problem of hunger in America with food boxes rather than by shoring up the existing food assistance programs seem to me to be very wrong-headed um, and surprising, although if you looked at the politics of it, you could understand what it was about. They were paying off favors. Um, and I think the revelation of how political all this is, is something, if the coronavirus pandemic has done any good at all, it's mm -hmm. to demonstrate to lots of people who didn't know anything about this, how the system really works. The same thing's happening in England with the school dinners and because they can't mm -hmm. go to school, they're not getting fed. People are going, mm -hmm. people are going hungry. Yes, pretty shocking. Sometimes in my darkest moments, I think that when I hear th you say things like they, they're just destroying the food, is that the situation isn't really dark enough. You know, if it was like a war, then, and then they really just had to open up and, you know, because probably they're destroying it right next to a school and things like that. If they just broke through free from their bureaucracy and just followed their human instincts to feed people and to help their, mm -hmm. help their fellow mm -hmm. humans. Um, yeah, but most of the decisions are based on who's going to make a profit rather than on um, social issues or social welfare. We've come a long way in the United States from the kind of government that we had in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, which was much more aimed at trying to be inclusive in bringing people out of poverty and so forth. Um, but that's changed. Do you think there's a deep year. irony here that that system was created because of a food shortage and to we must grow enough food for people and now it's working against them, the people that are trying to help. Yeah, I mean, I mean that obesity wasn't a problem in those days. <laughs> um, I mean, obesity didn't become a problem in the United States until the early 1980s, when all of a sudden there was this enormous surplus of food because of policies that had been enacted in the 70s, and the food companies had to sell it. At the same time that Wall Street began to value higher immediate returns on investment. Um, so that was a, a configuration of things that put us into a state of late capitalism. Um, uh, and that's what we're seeing now. Mm, corn syrup and all these other ingredients that <laughs> I always find right. it funny that the most of the, the, the ingredients that fast food and bad food processed food is made from is you can't actually buy individually in the supermarket right ultra processed is what we're now calling them <laughs> yeah 
and there's just like three or four ingredients that make most of the calories mm. it's kind of just because it's mm. in a nice marketed well and it's nicely packaged yeah and heavily marketed mm -hmm. so you think that's what you're supposed to be eating yeah getting depressed here <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> So. I mean, what, what keeps me from getting re depressed is that I teach students. They get it. You're doing a new class yeah. about COVID, yeah? Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'll be teaching that again this spring. Um, the, uh, the students get it right away. Yeah. They're all ready to go out and start fighting for a healthier food system. <laughs> I find that very inspiring. All these little Marion nestles ready to be dropped over cities all around the... <laughs> Yes, if I could only clone them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're great. No, that's fantastic. But do you think... So, oh, just struggling here to find the words because... So I just come back to the children because... Yeah, they, they're suffering, no, just to because people want to make a buck. Shareholders and... But do other people also in the schools? I've seen documentaries where the... Yeah, all the the chefs in the kitchen and everyone involved in the food chain is just they're just passing boxes yeah i mean they don't feel empowered to to do it make it enact any change themselves well it depends on which school it is uh, one of the things that i've discovered about schools is that they depend completely on who's in them it doesn't it doesn't even matter what the policy is if there are people in the school who think that feeding kids healthy school lunches is a really good thing to do they're doing it Okay, so it's up to what percentage of schools is that? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, yeah. I have no idea. But but there are thousands of schools now that have gardens and people in them who think that food is a great way to teach kids and the food in the cafeteria ought to be edible um, and healthy, and they're doing a great job with it. Okay. But maybe not across the rest of America, they still they just heat up what's the microwave or what fry what's yeah. I it just so depends on the individual school that it kind of boggles your mind trying to deal with it. But I think maybe because the new school rules that the Obamas put in um, made the food healthier, that a lot of schools are doing just fine with it. So you think Obama that Trump didn't have time enough to roll back all of that? I rolled back a couple of things and there are schools that will take advantage of it but a lot of schools are ignoring the changes okay so, so, so do we need like a national food policy agency or oh, yes of course we do mm, good idea. that would be fantastic <laughs> it would be fantastic if we had one and Tim Lang in Great Britain has just written a whole book about a new food policy in England um the, yeah, that would be very good, and there's a big push for it. Uh, whether we'll get anything like that or not, I really don't know. Did you ever work for the government or do any advisory? I did. Oh, yeah? I, worked for the, I worked for the government for two years in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. I was editing the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health. I talk about it as my two years in federal prison. <laughs> Uh oh, right. it was pretty tough <laughs> working environment. <laughs> oh dear, but maybe that was even more of a reason to do it to to break through. Yeah, no? yeah it was very difficult working environment, but um, I learned a lot. Because you're a very independent person. No? I mean, you're you you're striving through. You're doing these. You, your personality really comes through in all your blog posts. I mean, you're blogging every day. You're so passionate, still, even though you're retired. Five days a week. Oh, Five days a week. Yeah. Um, no, I fled back to the university where I could say what I wanted mm. and wasn't being yelled at all the time for saying something partisan. Um, and at universities, you can, you know, you can get into your own trouble and you're responsible for your own trouble. You're in trouble. Go deal with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's uh, I thought the uh, university was a much better place for me. Yeah, you're telling me it sounds much better. I mean, I've never worked for the government, but it can't say it appeals to me. But you just wonder where you can make the most difference as an individual, no? Obviously, with you, it's, you know, your writing. But 
Well, I, I think you have to find what works for you. And what didn't work for me was uh, going to demonstrations and standing on picket lines and doing that kind of thing. Um, but what does work for me is teaching writing and giving lectures and doing those kinds of things and talking to people on podcasts. Um, you know, I mean, that works for me. It's, I like doing it. I like meeting the people I'm talking to. I have no idea what the effects of it are, but it's how I can work and do this kind of work. And I think people who want to do advocacy have to find their own way and find what works for them. Well, you're doing a great job. I mean, you appear in these documentaries, you, you speak to these journalists, you, you you lend your weight behind it. So you're definitely you're doing your bit. Trying. Well, um, I was actually working already working on a song today. I didn't before speaking on you because I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to focus on the, the children and how mm -hmm. and how they're suffering. So I might just I think I'll go with that direction, even though it's not quite not quite what you said that there were some positive aspects and maybe it's not as dark as I was thinking but um, I know for sure in England the, you know there's still even when I was at school the, the cafeteria was selling junk junk food you know mm -hmm. and there's just so much evidence about how formative years these processed foods destroy you know your brain and your body mm -hmm. so well, what, what, so what is the future of food then? What, what, we, are things going to get better? Can we, can we end on know. a positive note, Marianne? Well, they're only good. You know, as I said, what inspires me is that there are young people who are interested in these things and the future lies with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if, there, if lots and lots of people are make, want to make sure that we have food systems that work for public health and the environment, that, that's what we'll get. Yeah. You know, and those of us who are past our prime just have to get out of the way. So, so I'm leaving it to them and cheering them on. Yeah, because the marketing dollars are paid for by the consumer. No, I mean you you are fueling the cycle. So, absolutely, mm. absolutely, be the change you want to see in the world. Nice. Mm. All right, Marion. Well, I think we, we had a great chat there. So, um, thanks again for spend, spending the time with me. Great, happy to be here. Can't wait to hear your song. Okay, have a great day. Okay, bye bye. Process preserved, frozen and fried, set in the way too long to change, and the truth to tell.
Thanks for tuning in. Of all the podcasts in all the world, I'm glad you chose to listen to this one. Thanks for taking the time. If you enjoyed it, please rate it on your podcast app, share it. Um, if you like the song, you can listen to it on Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, everywhere. If you really want to support, you can buy it for a dollar from podsongs.com and send it to send it to a friend by email. Try and spread the love. I know nobody downloads anymore, but uh, yeah, what can you do? And I'm also joined Patreon as well. So if you really want to support, you can sign up there as well. Thanks for all your messages and in your words of encouragement. I do appreciate it. And thanks to my musicians, Mauricio Sanicola and Massimino Vodza and my researcher, Dori Verbo. All right, see you next time.